way to my left right here. Please welcome Justin Jordan, the writer of Shadowman. Next to him, Mr. Brian Reber, Ballard. Tom Ballard, the artist of Quantum and Woody. Robert Venditti, the Exo Man Award. And Mr. Matt Kent, One Shot Zero. milestones for the Valiant universe. Um, whether or not uh, you came to Valiant in the old days from the 90s, grew up with that, whether or not you started last year with the first summer of Valiant, or this summer is your first exposure to it, um, this is a great place to jump in and see everything that we're doing. The first chapter of that, of course, is Quantum and Woody, uh, written by James Asmus, art by Tom Ballard, come out in July. Um, a reinvention of the classic series by Christopher Priest and Mark Wright. Um, Dinesh, what is the uh, what's the new take on Quantum Woody? Does, it, does anyone read Quantum Woody? Anyone here read it before? The original? Yeah. Oh, two people, excellent. Okay, so Quantum Woody <laughs> is the world's worst superhero team. Basically, the premise is two idiots get superpowers, <laughs> then they get a goat. <laughs> they were adopted brothers, one's black, one's white. Uh, they haven't seen each other in a number of years. They their father passes away. They meet again at the funeral and discover that their father was not. Uh, he was not killed, he was murdered, so they want to investigate. They invest he works at a research and development facility. They investigate, they get into a brotherly spat uh, in the laboratory. They lock themselves in there, turn the machine on. Next thing you know, they're naked, they've got powers, the whole facility's exploded. Um, through a circumstance that we can't reveal right now, they, they get a goat. We have a very special <laughs> color that we have. You know, sound. Can't do it. Can't do it? Okay. Jody, Jody's here. Jody LaHoop, the editor of the book, is coming up right now. When he comes up, I'm going to make him make the goat sound for you. We have a talking cover. If anyone remembers, we did, when we launched Valent last year, we did an extra man of war QR talking cover, where Robert Venditti wrote a great uh, little speech for R. Garcia to, to say to the reader, you scan the, the cover with your QR code, with your QR reader on your phone, you put the phone up to the cover, that's it right there, and he says a cool little speech. We love the idea, we went back to it for Harbinger, and then now we've gone back to it against the Quantum Woody. This time, however, you uh, only get a talking goat. Do we have a picture? No image. We have uh, posters. We have posters at the booth, so come by the booth, get a poster. I have the original of our table. There it is. <laughs> 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 That's that's the talking goat. <laughs> so Quantum Woody is a fun book, it's a, it's a hilarious book, it's a buddy comedy. Tom Fowler is doing a great job on it. Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about it? I'm doing a great job on it. <laughs> <laughs> store when the original Valiant stuff was coming out. Um, that was the long and the short of my knowledge of any of the original Valiant stuff. Uh, I never read any of it. I didn't know anything about it. Um, I got a, I started getting phone calls from Jory, uh, from Jody. Sorry, uh, my colorist name is Jordy. It's impossible. Ladies and gentlemen, also, Mr. Jody LaHoop, the editor of Quantum Elite. Uh, a few months ago, Jody called me out of the blue and said, you want to start doing Archer and Armstrong covers? And I said, yes, and I raised my cover price uh, <laughs> to whatever I thought they, they would pay. And um, then that just kept going uh, with you know the Christmas card and covers for other books and unsolicited covers that they were sucker enough to pay for as well. Uh, and then finally he said, hey, we're doing this super top secret thing that we want you to do the cover for. Um, don't tell anybody about it. It's just going to be a, like a big goat. Um, and I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, and we went through the whole thing, and when I was, I was halfway through painting the cover, they were like, do you want to do the inside too? And I said, okay. <laughs> that was that. As you can see here, this is the first look at some of uh, Tom's inks from issue two, which is um, uh, them clanging. Jody, what's the clanging thing all about, dude? Comic fans love naked men, right? That's, if I know anything about this industry, and I've been doing this a long time, 
It's that comic fans love naked women. I believe they're naked for the first third or so of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Why the naked tits? Uh, they're naked because they're in the end of the They just exploded. Yes. <laughs> they were explosion. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a book that I'm actually with the client. So uh, at the end of issue one, there's a giant explosion in the lab in which they're trying to uh, get some clues as to what happened uh, to their father um, after the explosion. Um, they find themselves uh, miraculously uh, still alive uh, with these wristbands on their wrists and uh, sort of dissipating at the atomic level. They got the parts missing here and, and, <laughs> and there, right there. <laughs> right. So what they're discovering in this scene is oh, that's okay. They're discovering in this scene is this is the moment where um, they the wristbands uh, touch together while they're trying to escape uh, from the cops and after having uh, clanged together their wristbands they discover that they're all of a sudden normal again. Okay. and they find out they got their thing back right yes. here <laughs> exactly so, so the, the idea behind the clanging of the wristbands that's what I'm talking about <laughs> hey you asked me here <laughs> I did um, the idea behind the, the wristbands and the clanging of the wristbands is that the, uh, these guys have to stay together um, even though they don't get along, even though they, they on some level hate each other, and, uh, they have to uh, uh, clang together their wristbands once every 24 hours or so, or they dissipate and uh, die. So of course it's sort of like a metaphor for, uh, and you know, literal, I guess, in some sense, uh, man up. That's my little topic. What are these shadows? What are these shadows? What are these shadows? What are they? What are these shadows? Um, that's best left until the end of the uh, issue number two. Yeah. They're a surprise, Nash. They're a surprise. It looks, they look awful like, like, um, like, like a nightmare brigade. Yeah, they do look like a brigade of worst nightmares. Um, and they look like they have some kind of weird mental disease. They look like they have some kind of weird mental disease. They look like they have some kind of weird mental disease. They look like they have some kind of weird mental disease. They look like they have some kind of weird mental disease. They look like they have some kind of weird mental disease. They look like they have some kind of weird mental disease. They look like they have some kind of weird mental we have going on here that there's something that never appeared in the original series. If, if David Cronenberg had a had a uh, had a, a clown a, a birthday clown business, that's what they look like. <clears throat> I thought that would get a very good reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of your audience is just contemplating the fact they will never sleep again after Spike. <laughs> so that's not quite all the part on the wood of the end like after the summer. Uh, in the lead up to the release of the first issue. On July 10th, IGN is running a new weekly webcomic for it. It's called IGN. IGN presents Quantum Woody Weekly, uh, written by the series writer James Asmus, with art by Ty Templeton, who you may know from uh, Batman and Robin Adventures, uh, whose recent work on the Ultimate Spider Man comic book, and Eisner Award winner, super talented cartoonist. Um, are these going to be collected and printed? We shall see. But um, I would uh, keep checking back. So we still have four more to go. We started two weeks ago. Uh, we have a few response from these. Uh, if you're looking, if you've never read Quantum Woody before, if you're looking for um, a taste of what's to come, these are cute, you know, funny one-page gags. It'll give you a sample of what's important in the book. But you can totally start fresh with issue one, two, three, five. Next up, we have Exo Man of War, the very first book that Valiant launched just over a year ago. Um, Rob, you're coming up on the end of Planet Death just this month. These guys were hard at work at the con yesterday. Uh, getting final dialogue off to the printer for XO14, which is Carrie Hort's uh, final issue of Planet Death with Rob. Um, where are we at with them in, in the close of this? So we just met, you know, spoilers on, we met some other alien races in the Valiant universe. Yeah, um, one of the things I want to do is kind of sort of expand the cosmic nature of XO. Um, so I, yeah, we introduced some new, input here. So we introduced some new uh, alien races at the end of 13 that have also been played, sort of building out the mythology of what the mind is and uh, what they mean, the cars don't kill me, <laughs> what they mean in uh, the larger um, context of uh, um, their, not, I don't want to say conspiracy, but their overall plan across the universe, sort of revealing that Earth isn't the only planet that they've been to, they've been to all these other worlds as well. So uh, they potentially have, you know, just as they came to Earth and, and just uh, split it off. Okay, switch to top. He's a great writer. Yeah, I'm not a tech guy. <laughs> there we go. All right. All right. Um, so uh, 
you know, this idea that they come to Earth and they swap out uh, human infants with alien infants and then took the human infants, some of them, uh, and other humans as well, back to their home world to be slaves. They've done the same thing on other worlds as well with other alien races. And so Eric discovers all these uh, races on loan. And going into uh, issue 14, which is the end of Planet Death, as Arnold was saying, he's going to sort of unite these races into one uh, sort of single force and try to uh, get rid of, of uh, the leadership of the Vine that has been sort of chasing him around and trying to get the armor back from him throughout the course of the series. So this is all stuff that we've been working towards for the entire series up to this point. It's sort of going to be the end of this first long form arc that we've been working on. And then starting with issue 15, we'll begin the next long form arc, which will you know, go about another year or so, things like that. So that first issue um, of the next arc, issue 15, is going to have Eternal Warrior in it, which is a confrontation that we've actually, it was in my original pitch. It's, it's a scene that I've been wanting to, to write ever since I pitched for the series way back when. And it was just finding the right moment to do it. And uh, you know, we finally found the right moment. So you'll see uh, Eric and Eternal Warrior in 15 and 16. And that's going to uh, lead to even bigger things beyond that. So, so are at the end of Planet Death going to bring something very special back with him from Lowe? Definitely cannot say a huge spoiler. But um, he's going to make a big impact on Planet Earth, especially in the country of Romania. So what you yeah. see here is him floating over um, the capital of Romania. Yeah, that's Bucharest. Romania was the ancestral home of the Visigoths before the Huns came and chased them out into the Roman Empire. And so. Eric lived in Romania, but at such a young age, he doesn't even remember it. And so it's a sort of, you know, almost fabled paradise that his parents have talked about. Um, you know, the ancestral homes of the Visigoths and, and, you know, how beautiful it was and, and all these kind of things. And so now that uh, he has the ability to do so, he's going to go and take back his homeland, which is what I think a guy with the mentality of where he come from, this is exactly what he would do, having no knowledge of, you know, the United Nations or NATO or any of those kinds of things that we have now, these are all foreign concepts to him. So uh, he's behaving in the way that is completely rational and uh, even correct in his era, but he's doing it in an era where those rules no longer apply. And so that's going to be a large part of the, the friction of the next long form arc of the series. And so, I mean, you know, a, a, a guy in a suit in an army planning a foreign nation, occupying part of it, fortifying it, taking it away from the rightful government. It's obviously something that's not going to go unnoticed in the Valley universe and around the world. So that's what initially is going to draw um, the Eternal Warrior to try and influence them. Yeah, they've, they've, you know, way back in the first issue of the series, we see that this, um, you know, potential relationship between Eric and Eternal Warrior. He appears in the very first issue as a sort of the, the aide and chief counsel to Eric's uncle, who is the Visigoth king. And so this is something we always do when we come back around. So now he goes and appeals to Eric. In such a way, <coughs> you know, the, the, what I see is the difference between Eric and Eternal Warrior. Eric is a guy, they're, they're both people out of time from a certain extent. They both lived in the fifth century and all those kinds of things. But Eric went from point A directly to point B, you know, like sort of jump there, whereas Eternal Warrior lives through all of that. So where Eric hasn't had the evolving ethic that goes with the, the evolution of technology or, or government or society or any of that, that's what Eternal Warrior has lived through. So, while they both have knowledge to a certain extent, Eternal Warrior is much wiser. And so that's the conflict between the two. He goes to try to appeal to Eric as a counsel, like he used to do for uh, Eric's uncle, but it doesn't go very well. Sure. And this will foreshadow some uh, very big stuff we have coming up in the Valley Universe later this year. So if you're a fan of um, all these characters, if you're looking for a big picture of what Eric's been doing, I would suggest actually Family 15 coming out uh, in just a few weeks. Next up, we have Bloodshot Zero hitting in July, which is the third part of the Summer of Valley Wave. Uh, Mr. Matt Kinder, you might know from Mind Management at Dark Horse, just in the New York Times. Like, yeah, what, 
well, what's the what's it going to be? And it's like, what's going to you know his backstory? I'm like, well, that's what I was waiting to read. Like I wanted to read that. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so yeah, it was awesome because also as a creator, like I, it's impossible to read comics anymore as a as a fan. You know, like I did when I was a kid. You know, so I'm re as I'm reading all of it anyway, like I'm like, oh, but this is what I would do. Or this is what I wonder if he's going here. I wonder if this is happening. Um, so then it was just really easy. it was. I already had ideas. I was like, well, this is what this is what I would want to see. Um, so yeah, I just approached it like that, with you know, like having a history of you know more than one bloodshot, you know, and seeing him in different eras, and um, you know, he, he's sort of a, he was a blank slate in a lot of ways, where you could show him in different situations. And I really wanted to have him like fighting a tank, you know, in World War II. <laughs> so we get to see um, kind of the origin. Of so is that like a problem, it's such like a, a technologically far flung idea, like, you know, injecting that into the middle part of the 20th century, like kind of wrapping it up time? Yeah, to me that was fun. Like, to me the most interesting thing about Bloodshot is um, this crazy technology and where it meets humanity, and in this case Bloodshot's humanity, you know, like what is, what is Bloodshot, you know, which is one of the biggest questions I had. I was like, what is he? Is he, you know, am I going to be, do I need to be rooting for this guy? Or am I, should I feel bad for rooting for him, you know, because he's basically a killing machine. So a lot of it is, um, you know, the developing technology over time. So, you know, in the 40s, they don't quite have those nanites. They have other things. And then, so then I, part of the fun was in like coming up with not only the development of the nanites, but then what they do and why they were invented. And then, and then how that's going to affect his humanity. Spoiler. You also got to do a pretty awesome uh, cover for the book. Yeah. We had like a ton of response to the US. Yeah, it was awesome. I, you know, so part of the fun was coming up with all the different bloodshots from the different eras. Um, and so my concept was um, to show them all. You know, I wanted to draw them all. I wasn't going to get, I wasn't going to be able to draw the inside. So I'm like, I want to draw all the bloodshots. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it goes chronologically. It starts. The guy on the bottom left is like World War II. He's got a little Walter Pippi James Bond style. Uh, and I do a lot of weapons research too to get all my weapons right, you know, from the different eras. <laughs> then my favorite one is um, 70s Vietnam bloodshot on the bottom with a little bit of an afro, which I thought was super cool. Um, and I told Warren, I was like, well, we gotta do 70s bloodshot on his own. And he's like, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I don't know if that, officially that's not happening, but <laughs> in, our, in our minds it is. There's a pretty awesome set. Yeah, yeah, so it's fun. Anyway, so it just goes around to the, and then the future plunge. Yeah. You take a person like a one Chris Cross is there, mm -hmm. who's been working in the industry forever and a super talented guy, and he's going to illustrate his book. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Team led by Bloodshot. 
Uh, and that's really all we can say, except it's really, really awesome. Um, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. If I know anything about comic book fans, <laughs> <laughs> the two things they love are lasers and naked men. <laughs> Coming from Valley, naked men with lasers. <clears throat> Next summer. That's all the power. Laser core. Let her pin jack in the laser core. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Try to write that down. The uh, final book of this year's Summer Rebellion and our next ongoing series after Final Week is Greg Pock and Trevor Harrison launching Eternal Warrior, which is a big moment for us. This is a character that you've seen uh, seated next to a man of war. Saw him go up against Arthur Armstrong uh, last year, and you're about to see him um, go full flesh in the Valley Universe again in XO15 just next month. But we're going to pull back a little bit on the mythology of Exo Man of War in the Red Series and really get the spotlight on his character for the first time. Um, Nash, can you fill us in on a little bit sure. of the concept so, of the series? So, kill out the Eternal Warrior. In case anyone doesn't know, the Eternal Warrior is a, he's the brother of Armstrong. He's lived for thousands of years, but he has a different philosophy than Armstrong's. And Armstrong's philosophy is uh, hedonism, that life is a big party, that's the only way to enjoy it, there's too much pain, so I want to have a drink and find uh, someone to spend the night with. Gila, his brother, has a different philosophy. He feels that there is, uh, there is a duty that man has to make the world better, and he spent his entire life fighting to, to better the world. And he's built himself to be the greatest tactician the world's ever seen. The, the greatest warrior, he is able to use weapons that people forgot even existed. Um, it's a big mythology. He has a, a lineage of geomancers who speak to the earth. They tell him uh, where he's needed, where he needs to go, where the threats to the earth are. He has an antagonist by the name of the immortal enemy, a consistently re, uh, reincarnating uh, uh, force of chaos. Um, it's, a, it's a book that we've been looking at from the very beginning of developing out the universe. We wanted to hold that because it has such a big mythology. What you're going to see coming in September, Greg Park has done an amazing job of finding a, a very small, interesting window where we get to show um, slivers of the mythology, but we really get to spend time with Gil and, and who he is and what, what the toll is that, that this life takes on you. And um, the, the premise is that thousands of years ago, he was in a battle that he was losing, and his children you can see the battle here. He was in, in a battle with, um, with these crazy large uh, tribe members who are on basically ancient PCP. Um, so they're jacked up, they're insane. And they're drinking in the top panel there. They're all imbibing, um, for lack of a better term, ancient PCP before they go into battle. And the lad there is uh, who in the modern up. day universe we know as the Fist and Steel. Mm -hmm. 4,000 years ago is the Fist and Bronze of his people, the Bronze Age. Um, so so uh, they're, they're not doing well. Gilad is Gilad's fine, he's an immortal, he's a man of dying. And uh, his children come to save him, his two children. They, they flank the enemy and they win the battle, but the children are, they mirror images of him. As ruthless as he is, they are more ruthless. They're like the sons of Ares. And they go after the enemy encampment, <coughs> they slaughter the women, the children, uh, the, old, the elderly. Gilad doesn't want to have any of this, he gets in a fight with the children, and they take him down. They slit his throat, they leave him for dead. Uh, now he doesn't know that they're immortal, so he doesn't know that they've lived. Thousands of years later, he sees them again. The daughter comes back to him, and uh, he's not happy to see her. Because he basically disowned them. Uh, she says to him, we, we did some horrible, horrible things in those years. We let something out, something, we let something loose, something dangerous, and it killed, it killed my brother. So Gilad's mourning now. He's just lost a child, even, even one with his own. It's painful for him. And, he, and the daughter says to him, Gilad, uh, father, I need you to help me, or it's going to kill me too. We have to make this choice. And so the story is really about a father and his daughter um, as they go around town and, and they kill a bunch of people. <laughs> like all fathers. Like all fathers. <laughs> like That's family. what we do. Like our father's just right there, so we just throw it in each second. That's what we do. We go around and kill people. Can somebody switch seats with me? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great book. Trevor has done an incredible job. Greg Pike has delivered a uh, balls to the wall story. It's a big book in September. We're pushing it real hard. We think you guys are going to like it a lot. And these are some of the comments. Yep. Um, there's also another big confrontation coming in Shadow Man. So issue 7 went out uh, last Wednesday. Uh, but Mr. Justin Jordan and editor. <laughs> Uh, 
the spike things <coughs> referred to in the script uh, rather creatively as the tree. Um, that is doing something that will end up being very, very bad for all of us if Jack doesn't essentially chop that thing down soon enough. Um, that's going to poke into the real world and we will all be screwed. Um, Jack? Jack is in a, a relatively dark place. The problem with Jack is that he's thrown into this legacy and he has none of the training he should have had. One of the things that the other Shadow Men who preceded him, including Josiah and his father, was they were basically raised in birth to be Shadow Men. They know exactly what the Lord can do. They know exactly how to make it do what they want it to do. And they know what they're supposed to be doing. Jack doesn't know any of that. Jack knows basically what Dogs is telling him. And at this point, there's barely any betters left. So he has a very little knowledge of what he's supposed to be doing. And what he has experienced thus far has kind of sucked. You know, he didn't have much of a life to begin with. That was why he came to New Orleans, was to kind of find uh, what he was looking for. And in the process, what he's actually done is lost what little life he had. So, you know, on one hand, he's happy to be part of something bigger than he is. You know, he's looking for that. On the other hand, it, to some extent, kind of sucks. So he's trying to come to grips with how he's going to live his life and how he's going to be Shadow Man when he doesn't have the resources he should have had to do the job he has to do. Now, did everyone out, did anyone here read Shadow Man Zero? The worst Yeah! Justin yeah. absolutely murdered that book, and if you look at issue eight here, um, to that right page, you might see a familiar looking rabbit running through the frame. Hoss and Pfeffer. Return of Hoss and Pfeffer. But, uh, the legacy of Shadow Man Zero isn't just going to continue thematically through the rest of the arc. Uh, coming up in September, uh, Justin and Roberto and Latoria are going to continue that story, following up with the next chapter of the life of Sandria and Master Dark. Um, you know, where are we picking this up, and uh, what is the significance of Sandria to the legacy of Shadow Man? Uh, it's a pretty huge one, and uh, there's uh, one of these covers that, yes, one of these covers could probably give you a huge clue to how she relates to it. But what Shadow Man 10 will tell you is why Shadow Man Zero was about dark, but wasn't called Dark Zero. So I assure you there is a intimate connection. Um, several of them to get to this point. But, you know, in general. We will, we will show you exactly how Master Dark and Sandria Dark relate to the Shadow Man legacy and what the Shadow Man Loa was created for. And it was created, and it has a specific purpose. And Shadow Man 10 will tell you what that is. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, this, this story that Justin's telling with uh, Master Dark and Sandra and the connection to the Loa and the best Jack Bond is he's doing a remarkable job uh, and really, really can't wait for this one to come out. If you guys liked uh, Shadow Man Zero, we're going to pick right up uh, where, where we left off before. And uh, you guys are really good enough. Well, so we also have uh, Roberto De La Torre, who we saw some of his pages uh, earlier. He contributed. And this is a cover from him as well, but uh, he did some work on Shadow Man Zero, and he's going to be doing some work on Shadow Man 8 as well. This also was easier to finish the second film, which is just the beast. He's doing amazing, amazing work. And, uh, and yeah. This is the vibe of Shadow Man 3, which awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no doubt. Yeah, I really like Roberto's versions of, uh, well, everything, but in particular, Master Dark and Sandria. I, he, one of the things I like with Burgo is that he really gets kind of the essence of the characters, and you can see it just in Master Dark's expression in this picture versus how Sandra looks. You know what I mean? Kind of gets the differences in personalities that their life experiences is given. Sure. Represented visually, which is awesome. Does this mean Twist is alive? Nope. Okay. Mm. Now I'd like to, uh, as uh, I'd like to call up our assistant editor, Josh Yell, the editor of Marjorie Armstrong. And that was karate, in case anyone's not familiar with karate. <laughs> that was doing there is very impressive. So, uh, Archer Armstrong began a brand new arc last Wednesday, Archer Armstrong 10, uh, picking up and out of the footsteps of the Zero issue uh, from the month previous. Uh, Fred Van Lente is uh, kicking butt on his book as usual, uh, going full force ahead, taking Archer Armstrong back to the land of the faraway. Um, Art by Perry Perez. What is the general thrust of this arc, Josh? You know, what is the where Archer Armstrong? Um, it's a crazy time for Archer and Armstrong, uh, going out of the Eternal Warrior arc. The first visit is to Area 51, because that's what you do with your next arc, you go to Area 51. Um, the, uh, 
they, they, they're going to find a way to, uh, did anyone read uh, Turner Armstrong number zero? Did anyone check that out? Cool, so that was the first, uh, yeah, I dig it too. Yeah, that was the first appearance of the Far Away. Um, and uh, in the new arc, Archer and Armstrong are going to find themselves back in the Far Away for the first time that uh, Armstrong has gone there since the terrible thing that happened in Archer Armstrong Zero, which I guess is kind of spoiler news, so I won't talk too much about it. But yeah, they find themselves back there and they have an enemy, uh, the greatest Fred Ben Lente creation of all time, General Redacted, uh, which is where the term yeah, Redacted. Yeah. Huh? Which is where the term uh, Redacted comes from. Uh, because uh, uh, there was a general who loved secrecy so much uh, that they named uh, when you redact something from a document after him. Uh, but uh, he hunts them down in the, uh, the far way and they have a great adventure. Um, you're going to see some uh, familiar faces uh, that you've uh, seen in the Valiant Universe in the series. Uh, we have a ton of uh, fun stuff coming up. That's a cover from Emmanuel Lucchino uh, with uh, Armstrong uh, fighting a T-Rex and uh, one from Wando. Uh, with Alter of T Rex. I'm just a gigantic dinosaur fan, like just the world's biggest one. We saw a Jurassic Park 3D together. We did. We did. It's <laughs> amazing. So good. It's amazing. Um, but uh, so this arc, obviously the far away as you saw in Zero, has dinosaurs. So uh, this one is just filthy with dinosaurs. I probably went over the top. We probably all did. We're getting dinosaurs in this thing. But uh, I think a friend of mine today has a vision, a uh, very smart thing about the far away. It's kind of a repository of every single crazy thing. So you'll find that there's dinosaurs there, there may or may not be some, some robots there, there's a lot of lost super science, there's some key things that went missing in the Bermuda Triangle, there's uh, the lost colony of Roanoke, and, it, and there's, there's may or may not be aliens as well. It is like the, the ultimate um, you know, exercise in a bizarre fantasy land. Yeah, something I love about Archer and Armstrong uh, as a series is when the Fred, is, he's such a historian, he gets so well, is the... Uh, all the things, all the mysteries, all the secret societies and the cults and all the things that we don't really have an explanation for as people, and if you do, you're one of the people like, just like shouting it crazily on the street, the, he, there's a reason for all of those, and they're, they're based in something in the Valley Universe, and Fred really gets to the heart of them. So all these, so many of the things that you think have been lost through time and things that have never been explained, the answer is in the far away, and Archie and Armstrong are gonna go there and uh, discover it. So uh, it's, it's just a crazy fun arc, uh, and it's a, uh, and again, it's going to have a, a for the next year in the Valiant Universe, it sets up something uh, rather large. So yeah, it's going to we'll be talking about something in a, in a few weeks about Archer Armstrong that could be a big turning point as well. Yeah, super fun. And uh, yeah, yeah, Perry and Fred are doing a great job. If anyone, if anyone is not reading Archer Armstrong who likes the Valiant books, I would recommend it. I think it's super sweet. And number 10 is a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, one, one second, hold on. So, so Josh Johns has just recently become full editor on Archer Armstrong. It's a, a well-deserved promotion. Uh, and his parents are here today, somewhere. Where are they? I just want to embarrass them a little bit. Mom and That's my mom and dad. My mom, there'll be a QA and a later on. Yeah. That was just an absolute nightmare in high school, so we can just rehash that. <laughs> um, so Hardcore are going to make their first appearance in issue three. As you guys might guess by the title of Bloodshot and Hardcore, these guys are going to have a pretty huge role in the universe going forward. Um, Josh Dysart has done some very smart things in bringing this team into the 21st century, even though their powers may still be stuck in 1992 or 1993 when they first retired. Um, as you'll see in chapter three, or in issue three, they um, have to use, uh, sometimes have to use cell phone networks. Oh, Josh, so smart. Josh, that's smart. But, um, they, they, uh, he's written them so that they, because Project Red Spirit is so decimated by Bloodshot and Harbinger Wars, the only way they can trigger the powers in Hardcore, Hardcore have chips in their brains. They can emulate Harbinger powers, but only one at a time. They have to call the powers out and they're beamed into their heads. It rewrites their, their, their cortex. Uh, Josh has written it so that because Project Red Spirit is so decimated, they only can, can use telephone network, so they have to use 4G, which isn't the best uh, way, as anyone who has a cell phone today can tell you, uh, isn't the best way to get information downloaded. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. It, it creates a lot of interesting obstacles for the hardcore. And this, in Harbinger Wars 3, you'll see uh, a bunch of the members from the classic hardcore team of the original Dying Universe, and what's become of them in their kind of semi-tragic lives. And that's uh, Charlie Palmer, who's their de facto leader, is going to be uh, a major player going forward there in the program. And excellent color. 
Board Tour number four. Can't say too much about it, um, but when this comes out in July, um, this is one you will not want to miss. We've been building towards this for a while, and this will set up a lot of stuff. It's Fighter fun. Jets versus Pterodactyls. That's, that's my favorite part of it. Um, another book that we can't say too much about without spoiling the end of Harbinger Wars is the new Ark of Harbinger, uh, but we can say that the great Barry Kitson is coming over. Yeah. around and worked them out and we decided on the first set of like the ones we thought were most important. So just to walk you through them, uh, we have Exo Man Award and it's Metroid. Uh, won't do that? For legal reasons, we're not going to do that. Oh, oh. I am so sorry. <laughs> Redacted. 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 <laughs> I walked that back. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, a couple people, cool, other cool other things going on, lots of fun stuff. Um, we just partnered with Cinderblock, who are guys who you may know do, do a ton of band merchandise uh, for, for bands like Sugar Rose and Radiohead. Uh, we're their first comic book licensee. They've done a beautiful job. They made these awesome t-shirts for us, like uh, this Jeff Lemire Harbinger t-shirt, the great David Aja, XO Man War one. Um, what's the third one? Oh, and Raphael Grandpa uh, Bloodshot t-shirt. Um, awesome stuff. We have it all at the booth. If you guys want to come check it out. Yeah. And then we have uh, one very special thing to announce, which is beginning in October. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to bring back some of the uh, greatest creators of the original Dying Universe are going to be coming back and doing a series of covers for us, uh, calling it Signature Series, something that you may remember from original Valiant. Uh, this is a bit of a you know, different twist on it, obviously, but we have some awesome guys lined up. That's Sean Chen doing the new Harbinger team, uh, who was a legendary creator on the original book. Mm -hmm. um, a couple others that will make everyone very happy. Bob Hall drawing the new Shadow Man. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> so much fun to work on and get in touch with these guys. There's a lot of guys that I didn't know when I started working at Valiant, and uh, with people I admire because I've read all the original Valiant stuff. And, uh, sure. Did somebody download and play the Harbinger War game over here? I knew it. I want to be talking. Anyone have a question for our, for our guests? You start. Yeah, uh, can't. Uh, did y'all get mad? <coughs> so what was that? Uh, 
chances that y'all get magnets back? Fred Pierce, our publisher, would be great to answer that question. What do you think, Fred? Right. Um, we dig the magnets, solar and turf stuff, yeah. for the, we're a part of classic media. Um, when we were reforming, when Dinesh and I were talking about this, I, I actually didn't want it back. Dinesh, as a, as a huge fan, didn't want it back. Um, I think the universe stands better now without that. Um, well, you know, solar, particularly with a key figure, I just think the universe the way it is today stands better without it. Um, I don't know that we could get it. I do believe you will see it in other iterations uh, again in the future. But if you look at the value of the universe the way it stands today, it stands, it's just a much, it's, it's a much more cohesive piece without those than with them. And I guess that's how we feel. If they were available, would we probably from a fun, you know, flat, fun perspective? But I don't think it's better for the characters. I don't think it's better for the user. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, this is for Rob Vanetti. I'm just wondering, when, when you put an EXO out in space, doing a cosmic EXO, how tempting was it for you to just keep him out there, to not bring him back to Earth and divest from the classic continuity entirely? Not very much, because I think that's so much of a, a part of his core concept. And, and the way, if you think about it from EXO's perspective, he's a guy from the fifth century who's now living in the modern day. That is as alien to him as like outer space would probably be to us, right? So he is kind of already in an alien world, and that's kind of the whole idea, you know? So um, that's not to say that elements like that, I mean, they definitely will be a part of the series going forward. Um, you know, I probably shouldn't say beyond that. But um, so yeah, there still will be that cosmic aspect of it, but I always wanted to have it, you know, primarily based on Earth. You, my friend. Uh, obviously, we restarted the value of the you know, business plan and such. Uh, how do you feel about it? Are you ahead of the business plan? Behind the value of the business plan? We are about between 5 and 10 percent ahead of where we need to be. So we're in a very good place right now. Yes. Yeah. Sweet. You, my friend. Um, one of the, a lot of the things in your promo is the show Bride. That still character you're looking back to series? What do you think? We love Rod. I love Rod. Um, you know, my favorite thing to do is Rod, a little sleeper move, and a uh, nice cherry in there, a little shake and You know, it's just, uh, it's good. He's just going to make too. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> All the way in the back. The Kissinger series, are those like going to be limited in spine, or is it just like Kissinger and they're not actually going to be signed. They're, they're signature series in the sense that they're, the artist signatures are featured on the uh, on the cover properly. Is that correct, Josh? Uh, yeah. The uh, David Barron, uh, my boy, is a uh, <coughs> colors on those, and we actually had when the artists sent in the artwork, we had them send in like a high res scan of their signatures. So they're actually on the co uh, the, the uh, cover, and Dave Barron keyed it in the coloring with the trade dress. So it looks beautiful, especially the Sean Chen, the, the flamingo pink. It looks like Vice City, and it's amazing. I love that. But yeah, they're actually on the cover. In case you couldn't tell, Josh is kind of a sports fan. So he was a big fan of other signature series that have been done featuring iconic athletes and such and, and you know, interpreted that through his lens. So this, this is not this is not the Valiant Validated Signature Series, yeah. which uh, Fred, I think you were involved in back in the day, where they would do limited editions of the books and signed by the artist. With a certificate and by the artist. artist. With yeah. a certificate. This is not that. This is something you'd be able to buy. Um, that the signature will be on the book itself, but it won't be hand signed. Okay, so two questions on the signature series. Sure. So is it going to be like a full box variant, or is it like a limited run, one in 20, one in 50? We're still deciding. I would okay. probably assume that there would probably be an incentive variant. And second question, are we going to get another Bart Sears cover maybe then? We all love Bart Sears. <laughs> we have a new Bart Sears cover, right? Yeah, we have. We're waiting for the right month. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We've Joe Posada. We've paid for it already, we'll use it. <laughs> <laughs> what about Joe Q? Fred, what about Joe Q? <laughs> I cannot tell you how much I would love to have Joe Q, but he's involved with some other company. Yeah. <laughs> I forget its name sometimes, they, but they, they I don't think it's possible. They forget where they came from. Yeah, I don't know. They, you know what? They've never forgotten where they came from, but he has other obligations today. Gotcha. You know what's cool, though, Frank? Why don't you tell them the story about how we asked for, for Ninja trade? The hardback. Joe, Joe Kasada, for you beginning, Joe Kasada, uh, when we announced the Ninja, the original collection, the original books collected in, in, in the Valiant Masters hardcover, he sent uh, Fred an email asking for uh, five or ten combs. So he has not forgotten where he's come from. He loves the universe, loves the characters. Uh, he's just a very busy man. 
I will, I will tell you, the, um, the Old Valley was a very um, mystical place, and anybody who was involved, we would all stay very close. So, um, it's a whole group of people. And for those of you who don't know, I was involved in Valley in the day. I know I look too young to be, but I was involved <laughs> in the Old Valley in the day. Um, and it's a whole group of state folks who are also very close. Well, there's one or two we're not friendly with, but that's the value of history that you all know is different. <laughs> uh, time for one or two more questions. Yes, my friend. Have we, uh, you guys got any plans in the near term for the future of the Valiant Universe? So you know you're not going to do Magnus. Does that, does that take out the year 4,000 entirely? We, we, the, the, one of the mantras of the company is slow and steady. We, we want to make sure that we expand the line uh, in a way that uh, you can keep up with it, uh, in a way that allows us to keep the quality of the new books high, but also quality of the old books high. The future is something we've talked a lot about. It will come when we have the best possible version of it. Uh, the best stories in the value are yet to come, and the best future stories, we're going to make sure we get them right before we, we get them out there. And there's a ton of characters, I'm sure you know, from the original value universe that reside only in the future. So it's something that we're very much aware of, and there's a lot of fun happening. Uh, one more question? Anyone? Yes, yes, sir. I have Madden from Matt uh, or I have both of you guys again. Any anything in the future you're working on for Valiant or is it just gonna be bloodshot? I'm a big fan. So. Yeah. Choose your worst character. Yes. What's my case? I want to say something about sure. I don't know how many of you know my background, but very briefly, I started out working in the warehouse at Top Shelf, packing boxes, back in like 2002. That was how I got my start in the comic book industry. One of the very first books that I ever really saw, because I was very new to comics at the time, was this book called Pistol Whip, which I really was drawn to because it was set in the, uh, the era of like old-time radio dramas, which my grandfather would always tell me about when I was a kid, and it was drawn by Matt Kent. And I remember reading that book a long time ago as I'm trying to break into the industry, and he was already an established pro and everything. And I remember reading it and thinking, I didn't even know comics could be like that. It was such a different sort of voice and different style, and it was, it was just so unique and so great. And so, uh, I don't know, I just, for me personally, like 11 years later, for us to both be working at Valiant like this, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's something I never thought would happen, and uh, that's really cool, you know. But the moral of that story is be nice to the guy that packs your boxes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'd just like to thank everyone so much for coming. Thanks for being a great crowd. Everyone have a very awesome Heroes Con. That's right, that's right. I'm good, that's good. Uh, for anyone who's never been to a Valiant panel before, uh, we'd love it that you guys come here. We deeply appreciate the support. Uh, come by the booth, say the password dead side to one of us at the booth, and we have a special surprise for you. So please come on by. Thank you very much for an awesome show. Also, 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 all these guys are set up at the show. Uh, Man Man Mind Management from Matt Kim. It's an amazing book. Green Lantern just came out this Wednesday from Robin Diddy. It's an amazing book. Tom, where are you set up? Uh, it's 805. Go see Tom's, uh, go piece. Where are you, Brian? I'm at your booth. You're at, Brian's at our booth, come get stuff signed. <laughs> and then, Justin, where are you? I'm at 1230. And Justin's got Luther Strode, which is also an amazing book. And go, check see, out what he's got go see Justin and Rob on the Green Lantern panel. Right there, like half an hour. Uh, two, yeah. Two. Okay. Thanks, Thank guys. you so much, guys.